Idaho Experience is made possible with funding from the James and Barbara Semino Foundation devoted to preserving the spirit of Idaho, from Ann Balake and Louise Nelson, from Judy and Steve Meyer, the Friends of Idaho Public Television, the Idaho Public Television Endowment, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. World War II was over. National leaders who had rushed to build an atomic bomb to end the war were looking for a new way to prove the United States was a country not to be trifled with in the post-war world. We can make an explosion, but if we can control that radioactivity, there's more we can do. Back then, what we know as the Idaho National Lab uh, was really a national reactor test facility, and there was a lot of development in that area. As the United States was developing a nuclear reactor in the remote desert of Idaho, the U.S. Navy was working to develop its own reactor a few miles away. Rick overlooked at atomic energy and realized we wouldn't have to refuel like we did during World War II in the middle of an action if we were using nuclear. Admiral Hyman Rickover, known as the father of the nuclear Navy, was intent on developing a submarine engine that didn't rely on traditional fuel. If successful, it would make the U.S. Navy a true world power. He believed that nuclear power could offer a warfighting advantage, so he created uh, an organization uh, starting with a lot of learning that went on in 1946. While submarines and aircraft carriers are built near oceans, the reactors that powered those ships were built here in Idaho. If any state has a DNA connection to the nuclear Navy, it is Idaho. The very first nuclear ship, the, the Nautilus, a nuclear submarine, the propulsion system was designed and built in Idaho, eastern Idaho. But when Admiral Rickover brought the naval reactors to Idaho, it's been a great boom to the state of Idaho and to the Navy. 40,000 sailors would rotate through Idaho as part of their training before being assigned to nuclear-powered ships. And I grew up in Idaho Falls with all of those sailors, uh, and they, they made a big impact on our community. They were welcomed, they were loved. The people in the community were really proud of the fact that we could be a part of our national defense. Idaho Experience takes a look at the original prototypes at the Naval Reactors Facility in eastern Idaho. Now being demolished, take a look at the historic work being done at the remote and restricted facility that few get to see. This is Idaho's Nuclear Navy on Idaho Experience. In eastern Idaho, the Arco Desert is an isolated, windswept landscape full of sagebrush and wildlife. In some places, it extends beyond what the eye can see. In the 1940s, the land was a bombing range for the Army and artillery range used by the Navy. But the Atomic Energy Commission, created after World War II, saw this as a land of opportunity it would soon be the home of the National Reactor Testing Station. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, the United States military complex was not like it is today. In fact, it was pretty weak, and the Army and the Navy had to start building up their systems. For the Army and Navy for national defense. Almost immediately after Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, 
President Franklin D. Roosevelt began to build up military supplies and equipment. That included a Navy ordnance plant outside Pocatello. The Navy has a long history with the state of Idaho. Back in the, in the 40s and earlier, it was a proving ground for uh, naval battleships and gunfire. So we actually tested and, and proved uh, the ability to operate guns out there, large guns that were on our warships. The Pocatello Naval Ordnance Plant was commissioned in April 1942. The plant was built to manufacture, repair, and assemble large guns on naval ships. Those guns have a very short life once you start firing them. They can only handle so many rounds through before the lining breaks apart. So they have to be refit pretty regularly. And the Navy needed a place where they could do that. And it had to be someplace away from the coast because there was still no idea whether or not our coast would be attacked. Once repaired, the guns had to be tested. The massive 16-inch guns were loaded onto a train and sent into the desert between Idaho Falls and Arco. It was known as the Arco Naval Proving Ground, roughly 270 square miles of flat ground in the middle of nowhere. We had to uh, shoot projectiles miles and miles, and so we needed a big open spot in order to be able to do that. So they would take the barrels out and they picked a spot over there by Arco and they would mount the gun on a stationary platform and they would fire it to make sure that the, the lining was fit properly and the gun worked properly. When the Pocatello Naval Ordnance Plant closed in 1949, the Naval Proving Ground was no longer needed. Uh, shortly after World War II, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission was formed, and there was a new demand of taking this new technology, nuclear power, and ultimately use it for commercial applications and the potential of using it for naval applications. Back then, what we know as the Idaho National Lab uh, was really a national reactor test facility, and there was a lot of development in that area. Similar to the top-secret Manhattan Project that built the atomic bomb, the U.S. government was in a race to use nuclear fission to produce power. Since most of the artillery range was no longer needed, the federal government decided on the Arco Naval Proving Ground to build a first-of-its-kind nuclear reactor. It was actually competitive at that point. I believe Montana was in the running, but ultimately we decided that it was in an area that was already being utilized for testing purposes, and it was also the national drive. So both of those were critical for the decision of where that was made. And there was this idea that, you know, we can make an explosion, but if we can control that radioactivity, there's more we can do. We were trying to understand how to commercialize uh, nuclear power, but also how to apply it. Construction on the new National Reactor Testing Station began in the mid-1940s. Here there are more reactors of more advanced and different types than in any equivalent anywhere. This rolling desert plain has been nicknamed Prototype Prairie. While the civilian side was working on an experimental breeder reactor, EBR-1, another project was in the works by the United States Navy. What was it like back in World War II? Submarine force obviously added significant value, but they were diesel submarines. And while they had significant war fighting capabilities, they had one Achilles heel. And that Achilles heel was that they were diesel powered and they needed air in order to operate the diesels to recharge the batteries. Effectively, diesel submarines were uh, surface ships that momentarily submerged underneath the ocean in order to be very stealthy in order to conduct their war fighting operations. The Navy selected one man to find a solution to the submarine problem, Captain Hyman Rickover. Rickover became an admiral later in his career. He started um, at lower rank, but he was a, a brilliant man. Just a very unique individual and a very focused man. 
you know, we might say now that he was obsessive compulsive. And he was able to lead his people that way too. In 1946, a group of naval officers and civilians were assigned to work on the Manhattan Engineer District's Daniels Tower Pile Project at the Clinton Laboratories, now the Atomic Energy Commission's Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Senior member was Captain, later Vice Admiral, H.G. Rickover, a qualified submariner and engineer with a strong faith in both the practicality and necessity of atomic propulsion. Uh, he believed that nuclear power could offer a warfighting advantage, so he created uh, an organization uh, starting with a lot of learning that went on in 1946. But the organization partnered with the Atomic Energy Commission and set out to uh, lay the groundwork for having a nuclear-powered submarine. The reactor, encased in heavy shielding, contains fuel elements of highly enriched uranium. Once the Navy had a plan, it needed to prove that it worked. It made sense to utilize the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho to build the prototype naval reactor. Construction began the fall of 1950 a few miles north of EBR-1. Working at a fevered pace, it was well underway the following summer. The Navy, with uh, the federal government, brought in the best of breed out there. We brought in electric boat to create and build the uh, S1W prototype. We brought in the Argonne National Laboratory to do design work on the reactor plant. We brought in the Bettis facility in Westinghouse to design the propulsion plant. The main building, pump house, and gatehouse were the first to be completed in 1951. But an early issue the project had was finding components for the reactor. Because this was a first-of-its-kind reactor, there weren't parts you could buy off the shelf. So Captain Rickover had to find someone to build them from scratch. When he stood up the nuclear power program, he needed industry to produce components with precision and high quality. At the time, the industry didn't think they could do that. He had to create the authorities and responsibilities and get all those aligned with the resources to do this, uh, to deliver nuclear power for the nation. But because of his persistence and demanding nature, he was able to achieve that and that sets the foundation for everything that we do today. The submarine thermal reactor project came to be known as S1W, reflecting that the reactor was built by Westinghouse. The S1W prototype, submarine first generation Westinghouse, was the proving ground for the Nautilus. It allowed us to prove out the concepts, to work on the equipment locations in a tight, constrained uh, hull, to prove out the shielding and to prove out that all of the components were going to work. It also allowed us to train operators. As the United States worked on its nuclear reactors, President Eisenhower pushed the United Nations to do the same. His effort was known as Atoms for Peace. The United States knows that peaceful power from atomic energy is no dream of the future. That capability already proved is here. Now, today, a special purpose would be to provide abundant electrical energy in the power-starved areas of the world. On December 20th, 1951, nuclear fission lit four light bulbs at the Experimental Breeder Reactor 1, the world's first electricity-generating nuclear power plant. Just down the road, the Navy was also making headway on the submarine project. In March 30th of 1953, S1W went to critical for the first time, and believe it or not, that was only 70 years ago. After some reactor physics testing, the uh, S1W prototype then went to full power operations, and that simulated a submarine going full speed across the Atlantic. And that was a game changer compared to what a diesel submarine could do. The S1W prototype was unique. 
Rickover demanded that it not just generate power, but that it operate safely underwater in the tight confines of a submarine. EBR-1 had already lit lights. He wasn't worried about that. He wanted to see, can it fit inside of a submarine? So they didn't just build a reactor, they built a reactor and put it in the shell of a submarine engine room. Because he wanted to see how are the engineers going to work with it? Are they going to be able to get to different pieces? Can it be done safely? What happens when you have a problem? Where are your procedures going to be out in the middle of the Atlantic when you start to get some radiation leak in the water? So he set that up for S1W, and the, the development time was insane. There was a pool of some 300,000 gallons that surrounded the, uh, the prototype, and that was to test all the interfaces with the sea. The Navy proved the reactor could work, but Rickover was determined to push the limits. Once the core had been replaced, he asked that S1W operate even longer. The S1W prototype operated at 100% reactor power for 66 days, and that was equivalent to circumnavigating the Earth twice. A uh, pretty amazing accomplishment, and that really proved the viability of nuclear power in a, in a warship. That testing in Idaho proved the Navy could use nuclear power to operate safely and effectively. That led to the world's first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus. It was commissioned in 1954 and left the shipyard in Groton, Connecticut in 1955. The Nautilus was terrifying for the Soviet Union. It sailed underneath the polar ice cap without having to sur surface, and their submarines couldn't follow it. And the United States had this ship now, or this boat, that could go out, get right up on the Soviet Union's front doorstep, and they wouldn't have any idea. It was a strategic move as much as it was a technical move. With the submarine problem solved, the Naval Reactors Program immediately started working on a larger reactor to power an aircraft carrier. The Nautilus went to sea in 1955, and then the Nautilus went under the pole in 1958, under the Arctic ice. At the same time, we started uh, building the A1W prototype in 1956. A1W, aircraft carrier, first generation, Westinghouse, was built with Rickover's attention to detail and safety. The reactor design would power the very first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, the USS Enterprise, being built in 1958. When you look at the USS Enterprise, it was to have eight reactors and four engine rooms. So he wanted to mock that up. Where are we going to put the reactor? How are we going to shield it? We're going to have a lot of heat off of it. How's that going to affect the crew? How can the engineers get to the reactors and run them in tandem? It's these questions that he wanted to solve in that environment that was completely controlled before he tried to build a ship. It was light years ahead of what anybody else could imagine doing with technology. And again, it was that driving personality of Rickover. How does a reactor power a naval ship? Nuclear fission breaks apart atoms, creating heat. Heat turns water to steam, and steam turns the drive shafts. Steam on an aircraft carrier also helps aircraft take off, powering the catapults. We started up the first reactor in October of 1958, the second reactor in January of 1959, and then Enterprise went to sea in 1961. An astounding record of pace and performance and commitment by the United States. And that all started right there in Idaho. The USS Enterprise was retired in 2017. It proved the concept for future carriers like the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower that's still in service today. While the Enterprise had eight reactors, the Eisenhower has just two. It can hold up to 5,000 sailors and launch up to four aircraft off its deck in roughly a minute. In 2023, the Eisenhower, known as the Mighty Ike, 
was sent to the Mediterranean. It is scheduled to be retired in 2028, replaced by a new USS Enterprise currently under construction at an estimated cost of $13 billion. Each new ship builds on the lessons learned in Idaho. Those first-of-a-kind prototypes were also perfect for sailors who needed hands-on experience before being assigned to a ship. Rickover believed that you needed to actually operate a nuclear power plant and to train on that nuclear power plant. And then we showed up out at the uh, Naval Reactors Facility, the S1W prototype. The first six weeks was classroom training. It was understanding all of the systems that you were gonna have to understand and, and operate that were unique to the S1W prototype. A sailor at the time would attend basic training, then nuclear A school, before getting hands-on training at S1W. In that third phase, Sailors were subjected to long hours of studying and operating a working reactor. And so a typical day was about 18 hours. You would sleep, wake up the next day, and go through your training. And you would do that literally until you ran out of food. And then you'd come back on the bus, you'd get replenish yourself, and you'd go back out there. Not everybody passed. Um, a lot of guys washed out because they didn't have the ability to do the math or they didn't have the mechanical ability. I do remember getting there in uh, like September of 1988 and leaving in March and I think I was frozen for the entire six months. And I remember getting up catching the bus at uh, four in the morning and then the 60 miles out to, to NRF and you got off, off the bus and in my case I went to S1W. I think I can draw everything that I learned you know, almost 35 years ago. Uh, that's how good the training was. There was a, like a little central library, if you want to call it, and you went up there and you, uh, you checked out a manual or an operating procedure or something like that. You'd take that back and you'd study and you'd learn about those things. And then you may walk into the actual prototype. I've heard it compared to like a very uh, elite college of four years, you know, crammed into to six months. Not everyone that went through prototype training was a sailor. Some were civilians like Doug Lenio and Kelly French. Lenio had just finished school at the University of Arizona in 1987. Westinghouse was recruiting down there and Idaho sounded like a fun place to be because I liked the outdoors. I was one of the first classes to actually be embedded with the Naval officers. I qualified on the plant, then turned around and started training Navy students. And you've come from nuclear power school where they've trained you on the theory behind everything. So you understand that, but now you're looking at the actual systems that you've looked at on paper. And you're looking at all these piping systems and electrical wires, and you're trying to think, oh my gosh, I gotta know how all this works and where everything is. And it's, it's somewhat overwhelming at first. What people may not realize is how noisy of a place it was. Because when the plant's operating, you have all kinds of rotating equipment. There's a unique smell inside of a prototype, having to do with a lot of the, the oils that are used in the machinery, and those get into some of the lagging. It gets in there and it sort of creates this, this smell that's very unique. I served at S1W from uh, February of 1983 until the final shutdown and a little bit beyond February of 1990. I then transferred to the S5G prototype where I qualified again as engineering officer of the watch. S5G, submarine fifth generation General Electric, is an advanced pressurized water reactor that lets the Navy evaluate the reactor's performance in simulated ocean conditions. It looked like a portion of a submarine set in a basin that would rock and roll. They would fill it with water and rock and roll, but that was before my time. The prototype actually floated on the water and we could incline that prototype or roll that prototype uh, so that we could test out the performance of the reactor plant under more uh, emblematic or prototypical sea uh, conditions. 
really, really important for the Navy. By the time S-5G was retired in 1995, the last of the prototypes in Idaho to go offline, 40,000 sailors had rotated through the Naval Reactor's facility. But Idaho has been vitally important to us. It's the birth of our program. It's where we learned about the development of these technologies, where we trained 40,000 operators. Sailor training at the three prototypes ended in the mid-90s, but the Naval Reactors facility in the eastern Idaho desert remains active. Uh, there's only one place that will process that fuel, and that is at the Naval Reactors facility. And that is uh, basically taking that spent fuel and placing it in a road-ready condition to take it to the National Repository. Absolutely critical part of the mission. As long as there is a nuclear-powered fleet, there's going to be a naval reactor facility in order to process that, uh, that fuel. Nuclear power provides our Navy with phenomenal warfighting advantage. But we have to respect the power and reactor. We have to treat it with the proper stewardship and the proper respect. Our sailors live right next to a nuclear reactor. They live and function near a nuclear reactor every single day. So to do that, we have to design a system that is conservative by design. And we can only do that by the trust that's been established and enabled. And that trust is centered on, as I said, protecting our sailors, our workers, the local populations, and the environment. There has never been a reactor accident in the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, and nor has there ever been a release that has affected the environment. The United States isn't the only country using nuclear-powered ships, but it has the most capable submarines, thanks to research and development conducted in Idaho. In 2024, the U.S. Navy plans to commission the USS Idaho, a nuclear submarine that uses advanced reactors and acoustic technology developed right here in the state it was named for. Well, how is it that Idaho, a, a landlocked state, has a nuclear submarine named Idaho? If any state has a DNA connection to the nuclear navy, it is Idaho. The very first nuclear ship ever made, the, the Nautilus, a nuclear submarine that Dwight Eisenhower used to send from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic for the first time ever under the Arctic, the world said, my word, the United States is back. It's the leader in science. It's the leader in the military. Former Idaho Governor Dirk Kempthorne is chairman of the USS Idaho Commissioning Committee. He is responsible for bringing the crew to Idaho and showing them the surprising role this landlocked state has played in developing submarine technology. The fact that the United States submarine force is the most silent in the world, well, that doesn't just happen. That, that means you have the finest of technology. Where does that technology come from? Idaho, Lake Pend Oreille, Bayview, the Acoustic Research Center. Again, the role that Idaho plays in the well-being of the nation, making sure that our submarines are the most silent and most technologically advanced. One might wonder why the historic prototypes with such a rich history of innovation aren't being turned into museums like EBR-1. What Rickover did in the Arco Desert changed the nation and changed the world. What he did in those buildings was truly historic. Every bit is as historic as EBR-1. The question is, well, why, why tear them down? Why can't we leave them there and use it for education? Well, these were nuclear testing facilities. And so you have contamination. You know, they were bringing in cores, taking out cores. They operated for decades. And the United States requires that we clean up our messes. Some parts and pieces of S1W and the other two prototypes will likely be in a museum someday soon, like the Idaho State Museum in Boise. We have over 100,000 cubic feet of government records, a half million photographs, 50,000 artifacts, 
80,000 archaeological specimens, and all of those things are the anchors and cornerstones of the stories we tell through exhibitions and programs, and our portfolio is quite full from an audience point of view. The story of S1W will live on thanks to an effort that goes back to 1966. President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the National Historic Preservation Act that requires federal agencies to make preservation a part of the agency's mission. And that act was created as a result of urban renewal in the 50s and 60s that caused a lot of inadvertent damage to communities. And there was a fairly large hue and cry across our country at the local level saying, hey, you know, if there's going to be development, if there's going to be projects that destroy our local resources, we need to have a voice. And out of that collective voice across the whole country, very powerful grassroots effort, came the National Historic Preservation Act. If a federal agency has an undertaking that has the potential to impact historic properties, they have to take into consideration that those properties in their decision-making process and work with our office through a consultation process to try to avoid, minimize, or mitigate any adverse effects to historic properties. The most commonly known of which is probably the National Register of Historic Places. That is the official national list of those properties considered important in our past and worthy of preservation. It's important that we preserve our history, not just history you read about in a book, but history that you can walk through, that you can touch, that you can smell and feel. That's what's important about uh, these types of uh, programs that preserve our history. Before the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program could start the demolition of the prototypes, officials approached the Idaho State Historic Preservation Office to start a conversation about how best to preserve the history of the reactors. Mitigation is what all parties can agree to, so that's what we try to do. We try to make it a win-win for the community and a win-win for the resource and a win-win for the entity that has to do the project. So in this case, with the project at the NRF to remove the nuclear naval prototypes, um, that's a pretty big impact. Those are unique, one-of-a-kind properties that um, once lost will be gone forever. And so, um, you know, we went into consultation with the NRF staff and other parties, other interested parties, from a position of, you know, this is a pretty big impact and, and we need to make sure that the consultation results in mitigation that's commensurate with that impact. One of the things that's so amazing about INL is this huge site and it's been protected for a long time, so the resources there are quite pristine. So often when the INL team has to look at their role in implementing the National Historic Preservation Act and all of the requirements that federal agencies have. They're very good at it and they know to call our team. Today, there are historic preservation offices in all 50 states. The Preservation Act is enforced with the awareness that our past helps communities shape their identities and their futures. Understanding the history of their community gives them a sense of place in the continuum of history and understanding history and thinking about the process of history also gives students in particular, but all of us, a better understanding of thinking, critical thinking, cause and effect, why something is like what it is. How are we here today? That comes through understanding how to do analysis. The NRF conducted um, oral histories with sailors who had been through the program and they sought them out nationwide, which was terrific. I believe we have 30 oral histories from former sailors that are going to be accessioned into the Idaho State Archives now. Um, this was critical, of course, because um, many of them are reaching an age where we're, we're losing them, you know, more and more. And so that was, we felt, a really critical piece of telling the story of the site was getting that um, first-person experience to share. And so at S1W, they had the water break, mm. which was, you'd have a guy stationed out there and his job was to adjust the pressure on a paddle wheel to simulate uh, sea pressure so that you don't cavitate. 
you're going to get qualified in 24 weeks or 26 weeks. This is how many points you need each week to stay on the curve. As long as you're ahead of the curve, life is reasonable. You get behind the curve, then there's percentages. It's uh, positive encouragement delivered with a baseball bat. S1W was a choice assignment, uh, uh, relatively simple, even I could understand it. And the uh, Admiral Rickover used to call it his little tea kettle because it was simple, rugged, reliable. And then the intent was that hopefully those oral histories could um, inform the documentary as well. This documentary is part of an agreement between the Naval Reactors Facility and the Idaho State Historic Preservation Office. This project has been in the works for several years to preserve the NRF's Idaho story. Because this story is so big, we felt that the partnership with Idaho Public Television telling this story was really critical for public understanding of the amazing world value of the INL and the NRF. If you look at some of the historical buildings and other things that we've preserved around the state of Idaho, we're lucky in that we're a very young in terms, of, in terms of history to the rest of the world. We can still preserve our history if we're smart enough to do it. So preserving these reactor prototypes that are going to be torn down, decommissioned and, and uh, destroyed, uh, I think is very important. I grew up in Idaho Falls with all of those sailors uh, and they, they made a big impact on our community. They were welcomed, they were loved, the people in the community were really proud of the fact that we could be a part of our national defense. And what's really interesting is a lot of them have stayed in Idaho or come back to Idaho after their military experience. And it's because they got so ingrained into our community and loved our community just like we loved them. I believe that efforts to preserve that legacy like this that we're talking about right now are critical. And I'm glad that there are people who are protecting this legacy and making sure we keep it for people forever. Idaho Experience is made possible with funding from the James and Barbara Semino Foundation devoted to preserving the spirit of Idaho, from Ann Balake and Louise Nelson, from Judy and Steve Meyer, the Friends of Idaho Public Television, the Idaho Public Television Endowment, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. <laughs>